Hey, Sean. Hey. So when we last saw each other, it was maybe about a month ago. It's been a while. We were yeah. at the arcade. Yep. And after the, we met at the arcade, we actually went out to a coffee shop with friend of the show, Zach Ratting. And you guys had a little discussion about the modeling. Now, he, he's a modeling expert. He has a CNC yeah. machine, and he's done a lot of this. So he had a lot of good ideas. He had some fantastic ideas. Um, I, and thank God for Zach, because this is, I'm, I'm, I'm new to CNC, and I foolishly chose this as my first project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little complicated. <laughs> um, so he had some really good ideas on, on assembly. Uh, I've done a new 3D printed mock-up, so we can kind of compare and contrast from the old one. Oh, excellent. And, and we'll give us an idea of what the cuts are going to look like. So I got my computer here full of cut files that are hopefully all good to go, and we'll load into the CAM software and get the cutting. We're actually at Zach's shop right now. It's called Build Cool Stuff. It's here in Concord, California, which is exactly what we want to do. It, and he does, yes. So uh, why don't we ring the doorbell and see if we can go inside. Hey, guys. Hey, Zach. Hey. Come on in. Thanks. Cool. This is my humble uh, shop. I love it. This is awesome. Did you paint that yourself? Uh, well, yeah, lots of spray paint and masking and found some cool image on the internet. That's fantastic. And this so. is our wood. This is your wood. Yeah. Soon to be your arcade cabinet. So, lots of tools, laser cutter, pick and place machine, all sorts of fun projects going on. So, hopefully, uh, we can get your stuff cut. Well, I think the first thing we should do is uh, catch Zach up on your latest 3D print and yeah. make sure we're all on the same page. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we can hit the files and uh, send them over to CNC. Sounds, Sounds good. Cool. All right. Let's take a look at this. So, this was the first mock up I did. So, this was based on the, the first internal design of uh, the uh, table. This is the one that we brought to Other Ocean. Yeah, and this is the one I first showed Zach. So it had these uh, these supports for each panel. There was two underneath each one that it would screw into. And then if we lift off the top, the uh, this was a solid hub, panels like glued or, you know, together. And then the fins, they're not, they're on the outside here, but they would protrude a little bit inwards and they would be fast somehow. And this would be one big piece. Mm -hmm. And um, Zach took a look at that and gave me some really good uh, tips on how to tackle that. So, as I recall, he said you could do it that way. We could, yeah. Or, or so, so <laughs> this is all based on uh, recommendations that, that Zach does. So first, he said rather than separate fins for anything, why don't you try to make the one big piece so they would be stronger that way, which makes a ton of sense. Um, and then along those lines, as we started thinking. If we could do that, maybe they could disassemble for transport, which would make right. getting, because that would be a really big piece to That's have a big to truck. get in something. Yeah, right? yeah, hopefully this is maybe a an SUV or even a you know station wagon kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, so based on his suggestions, I went, did this where we had these three fins that slot together. So they simply, and this would work the same way once they're all CNC, so they just do that. Um, and then just for pure, really for aesthetics, I'm going to have this little uh, like hub that will slide down on and it's not going to be strong enough to like hold it together per se, but it makes it look nicer mm -hmm. because I suspect that as we uh, transport and use this and take it apart and all that kind of stuff, um, it will get banged up at the where they all meet. So that will just really be, it's a piece of PVC pipe slotted so that it'll, it'll look nice, it'll hide the joints. Mm -hmm. So then... Your next suggestion, Zach, was to make this hub, right? Yep, and so I what? That. So what's the idea? Uh, why don't you explain the hub idea? Well, so you need something that's going to kind of have some strength to it, and you know, gluing and 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 screwing is really you know kind of kind of the best way to kind of keep something solid. So this is a small enough chunk of material that we can bolt together, uh, but still provide enough structure to kind of hold everything. So. Um, it doesn't hold the weight of anything. The legs actually do by kind of stacking everything on top of the vertical pieces, but it keeps everything together, all your electronics, yeah. and, it, and it keeps everything aligned. So this is something that we'll assemble from many pieces of flat pieces of wood. Yes. But it will be permanently a one piece. So we'll right? have two bulkheads, the, this plate here, and then this one on the bottom. Hmm. And then the panels will glue and nail to those. Mm -hmm. And then we have it slotted for the legs. So well, what will happen then is when we bring it in, uh, you know, it'll go into each of these slots of the legs. So the hub will always stay as one piece is the is the general idea. Mm -hmm. But it's still small enough to fit in a car. Yep. Or... Um, and then the hub will also have access hatches. So we have 
uh, this will be a panel that will come off. And these, uh, I picked these up, these, these vents that are going to be in the center just because they look cool. So inside <laughs> of this, inside of this, what are we calling it, the hub? Yeah. It will house the subwoofer, the amplifiers for all six speakers, mm -hmm. and the computer. Yeah. Is that right? That's okay. the idea. Um, so then this will be able to break down for transport. And then our top will be transported like this um, with the TV in it, the control panels, and uh, it will be so you can turn it up on, on its side to carry if you Get need through to. doors. And I added handholds for that on cool. the back. And we've also slotted this. So the idea is that the 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 fins will slot into the top. Mm -hmm. And it might just rest there with using gravity to stay well, in place? Well, it can. It totally can. And it's it, for once it's set up, it's fine that way. Mm -hmm. But we probably do want to bolt the base to this in case we need to like pick it up and like move it like once it's it's together. So that's easy enough. We'll put some brackets or something on the bottom with some screws that will accomplish that. Cool. And then each of these support fins also slot into the top and they will then also be bolted from the bottom so they're nice and secure. And we moved away from the two supports that were here in the center to these uh, on the side, so it just has these cleats that will be on either side that this will rest on and bolt into. But this is technically two parts. Yeah, for 3D printing purposes, I printed them as one, but there will be an additional bulkhead here at the, or a cleat here at the front, yeah. that this front uh, panel, which will be acrylic, right? because uh, it's gonna have your lights in them, which is the silver part, that will clamp on separate. So the front panel will go on and then the inner ring will go on a separate. And the, the acrylic will have a little bit more give. This side will be wood. This will yep. be plenty sturdy. So we're doing at a three quarter inch uh, lightweight MDF. Yep. The yeah. whole thing is being done in that same material. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Um, which is a lot like the, the material that arcade cabinets originally were made out of. Yeah. So but more, not, uh, probably not lightweight. No, not lightweight, but but yeah. I love that aspect. Yeah, and the, the lightweight, you give up a little bit of strength, but it's so much lighter, and this is going to be... We figured it out. The table is only going to be slightly smaller than this one, um, just by a few inches. So it's a big table, and it's going to be really heavy. Yeah. And so it's a trade-off on that, that we're going to do that to, to save on some of the weight and make it easier to transport. And you've added um, lots of uh, lightning holes, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, and then all the edging is going to get the T-molding, which is that rubber stripping that's on every arcade cabinet. Right. So A is going to make it mo read more like an arcade cabinet. It's going to protect all the edges on this, too. And I managed to fit in my my holy grail, the cup holder. You got the cup well, Every player gets <laughs> a cup holder. Very important. Very important. I think, you know, via our discussion, we're feeling pretty good about this. Mm -hmm. We got the cut files all, like, generated. Um, and we've we adjusted the tolerances a little bit uh, because as we discover, your materials are not always exactly on. Right, depending on which batch you get, sometimes a little bit thicker, a little bit thinner. So, you know, we just kind of tweak things this morning and uh, yeah. but I think we're looking pretty good. Now, um, you, we had made, you really put together a mock-up of a single station and that felt <laughs> right. Like you got the sizing yeah. just right. I'm really glad we did that. How too. confident are you that this center of gravity is not too high and that this, this is enough uh, area to support the whole cabinet. I think I think it's gonna be good. You feel I, good about that? Yeah, yeah. I think I think because it's uh, really heavy. This has not changed a lot from the like this, dimensionally. This is all based on our mock up. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's only really structurally that it changed. And uh, I think with these one piece legs that are all slotted together, I think mm -hmm. it's going to be plenty mm -hmm. strong. I think yeah, strength is, is and, pretty good. And weight, I think you've got a lot of the mass in this hub. Yeah. So that actually is going to bring a little bit of the mass lower. And cool. I think I think you'll be pretty and good. I did a little calculating, and and based on the weights I could find for the lightweight MDF online, I think that the max this would weigh is like two hundred and fifty pounds. I think at this point we're ready for the next step. Absolutely. Let's uh, turn your cut files into to CNC files. Cool. I can't wait to see what that looks like. All right, Zach. So I modeled all of this in Cinema 4D, which is a polygon modeler, which yep. is not exactly the type of thing you would generally, you know, use for this type of thing. Uh, I actually sat down and spent like about four days doing like uh, Fusion 360 tutorials and stuff. And it would be perfect for this. Right. But what I came to the realization is that this was complicated enough project that the the amount of time that it would take to get ramped up on Fusion to get to where I could do it all, it, it would just take too you, long. You had enough new things <laughs> yeah. to be learning. So, so I brute forced it. And basically, I, I worked in a very similar fashion to how you would do it in like 
solid or something. I started most of the pieces as splines. So mm -hmm. a 2D vector image like we have here, and then I would extrude it to the thickness of the material. And that allowed me then to slot things together and see if they work dimensionally, uh, like in a 3D space. And then I basically drop them down back to splines to send to you. Perfect. So that's just a, a DXF file uh, that you can open in like Illustrator or you know whatever. Right? Yeah, and so. be because we're doing mostly 2D cutting, almost like you would do on a laser cutter, mm -hmm. um, we just need outlines. So you gave me some outlines and uh, we kind of took them into my you know vector processing tool of choice, which is Corel Draw. Yeah. and uh, lay them all out and kind of figure out how we're gonna transfer those to the machine. Yeah. And now you did something interesting, which I loved, that you took the splines that I sent you and then you ch double checked them. <laughs> I did, so yeah, the, the back and forth is always great to uh, kind of catch all those, those little errors before we actually start cutting material. So um, yeah, we basically laid it out and uh, you know, try to figure out how can we fit all the pieces onto the different pieces of wood. So actually through the um, raw material, that's what these squares are, uh, onto the computer and then sort of fiddle them around until they all fit. We were hoping this morning to, to get them all onto three sheets, but we kind so of, oh, close. so close. Yeah. But yeah, well, we have a few extra on the on the fourth sheet, yeah. so we, we bought we, <laughs> we we bought some extra just in yeah. case. Yeah, and that's that's always a good call. Always, I think Adam's like always buy twice as much as you think you need, uh, mm -hmm. which is is words to live by. Yes, um, sage advice. And uh, you know, and so we got we picked up the material this morning. It's the ultra lightweight uh, MDF, and we did find that. It didn't quite match the three quarter inch thickness that it was advertised. Yeah, at. yeah. So, so a lot of times, you know, you get closer with MDF, um, but it actually is a shade under. It's mm -hmm. you know 0.71 instead of 0.75. So we even tweaked a little bit this morning, like all yeah. our slots, just to tighten them up a little bit, just so that when they come together, it'll be uh, it'll be a little snug. Is there so so doing a lot of the the 3D printing assemblies and stuff like that? Like I know the tolerances like if I need this to fit together I should make this hole this much bigger is there do you have general CNC guidelines for that thing or does it depend on the material it depends on the material so okay. I mean obviously if you're cutting out of wood you know you don't you can be a little more sloppy um, you know just because of the nature of the material because in the middle of the material it actually might be thicker than on the edges so right. you kind of want to have a little more you know looseness in uh, you know wood cutting if it's you know something like plastics or engineered material or metals you can obviously be much tighter tighter with your tolerances, so you right. can kind of get away with that. The beauty is too, with wood, you know, if it doesn't quite fit, hit it with a little sandpaper and you're good to go. So, yeah. uh, it's also more forgiving. One of the things that you did, which I really appreciated and I thought was cool, is that you took the 2D splines that I sent you and you you double checked them in 3D space. I did, just as a, <laughs> as a double check before we cut material, um, I took your 2D image and then extruded it to uh, 3D in my tool of choice, which is SolidWorks. Let's take a look at that. So. Go over to that guy. <clears throat> so this is a cross-section view of, of your the main components of your of your design. And you know, checking things like, you know, zooming in here and being like, okay, do the tabs intersect with yep. you know the different pieces? How does this this little section this kind of stack up where we've got the three panels coming together at weird angles? Mm -hmm. Make sure we can see light through, you know, <laughs> that you know, there's yeah. actually a little bit of clearance so that we're not really fighting it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think everything looked really good. I think we had one one, one little, little spot weird right thing. there where a tab was a little bit too long, and that was an easy fix. And so. an easy, yeah, it's, it's easier to fix in software. Um, though we probably could have hit it with a belt sander and uh, taken that off. But but yeah, yeah, it's good to catch as much as possible. The goal is to get it as close as possible, just like fitting together out of the machine. But it doesn't Absolutely. always go that way. Absolutely. But you're, this is the first <clears throat> build. You know, every every build's got something that isn't just perfect. But we can we can get there. So we'll cool. uh, we'll get it together. So let's go back to the the the, the 2D layout. Exactly. And so we've been doing a lot more laser cutting uh, lately, and so I'm getting used to like how to lay out things for that. And like one of the things that if you're being like super efficient, you know, like you'll overlap cut lines so that instead of having to like go around the, uh, like 10 boxes, you know, it will you know have two butted together and you just sure. do one cut. Can you? Do that kind of thing on CNC? Do you want to do that? You can. I mean, there's lots of little tricks that you can do to kind of optimize things. Um, you know, right now, this we're not going to optimize for cutting time just because we've got a lot of time to, right. to cut this stuff out. And hopefully this cuts out pretty quickly because it is, um, you know, the lightweight MDF. So 
Um, I'm less concerned about actual like cut time optimization, more concerned about holding it down. That's actually one of the big problems. So like when you're laser cutting, there's no force really on the material. Right. But in CNC, you're basically fighting that tool going through the material. Right. So you have to make sure it's held down well. So a lot of thought goes into kind of placement of the different parts and how you're going to clamp it to the table as right. you make the cuts. Now, some big fancy machines, they have a vacuum table. I've and seen it, it's and, awesome. and that's pretty awesome. Um, I'm, not, I'm not that cool in my shop, um, and I, do, I don't do enough kind of repeated things where the vacuum table makes sense. So I just have a large um, bed that we can screw down to and clamp down to right. that lets us kind of hold things. So when, when I looked at your drawing and I said, okay, where can we you know, add clamps? Where, can, where do we have room to uh, put extra fastening holes and you know, fortunately, a lot of this design has screw holes already in there that we can kind of reuse to clamp the pieces down to the table as we cut them out. Because what we don't want is when you actually start cutting it out and getting to that last little bit and then having something move on us because then you'll end up with little kind of wavy right. lines or weirdnesses. So how, how, how does the process, if it has holes in it already, do we have to drill the holes first and then? Exactly, so we'll, we'll, we'll actually do the cuts in multiple passes. So we'll go through a drilling pass, we'll do that first, because all the force is straight down, it doesn't actually you know, shift around very much. Then we'll go back and we'll actually screw down oh, to the bed okay. to hold everything down, and then go back and cut the outlines. So you have to do a little bit more upfront thinking about it, but it's actually pretty similar to the process of laser cutting, just a cool. bigger scale. And then you were able to go in and add some, some tie down holes, uh, on hidden parts of, of th other things where they wouldn't be seen. Exactly. Now, what about parts that we don't have the luxury of putting holes in? Like, how do you handle that? Right, so you have to come up with some other scheme. So depending on uh, the cut order, we can um, you know, cut things out in an order that makes sense so that it, things are held pretty much all the way up into that very, very last second. Um, we can also do some tricks. So one of the tricks is adding tabs. So instead of cutting all the way through the material, mm -hmm. um, we might leave just a very small bit of the material to hold the piece in place while we do it, and then at the very end, come back with a tool and just manually cut those little tabs. I got it. It takes a little more sanding, a little more finishing, but for, for small parts that you actually care about the complete surface, yeah. that's a good way to go. Okay, great. So what's the next step? Uh, next step is to take the 2D drawing that we've kind of laid out and kind of figured out where things are at, we're going to take this into the CAM software and actually convert it to G-code, which our uh, CNC router can take. Same as a 3D printer. Same as a 3D printer. Nice. Here we are. This is our uh, CNC machine. We've got your drawings up on the computer. Uh, the, basically the next step of taking your flat drawings and then converting them into G-code is telling the machine exactly where and how to cut. So we decide early on that we're gonna use a quarter inch end mill to cut everything. Right. And That's uh, why the line is away from the line. Exactly, right? unlike a laser cutter right. where you actually cut on the line. It's a quarter inch away. It's a quarter inch away, exactly. Hmm. It automatically offsets that, but you have to tell it whether you wanna cut inside the line or outside the line, depending on whether it's a you know, <laughs> inside feature or outside feature. So there's a number of things that just kinda of have to keep, you know, you have to keep a uh, track of when you're doing CNC stuff. Um, so obviously, so for like our whole cutouts, you can see that they it's going on the inside, so they look the exactly. right. Exactly, yeah. This little arrow shows where it's actually cutting. Okay. We also have a ramp in so that, you know, instead of starting right on the line and just dropping the tool straight down, if you've ever tried to drill a hole that's you know perfectly straight, sometimes that bit wanders a little bit. Right. Well, the same thing will happen on here. Cool. So if you start with it outside of where you want to cut, then it ramps in nicely clean. and it gets a really clean, cool. uh, clean cut. All right. So um, yeah, once we've once we've done that, we could do a quick preview. Oh, so that's showing the travel. This is showing all the so the, the red lines are the rapid travels, and then the area that's actually cut away is uh, oh, where our cuts are going to be. We've also added a couple spots where we put tabs in. So some of the areas that aren't clamped, we've added tabs to kind of hold the piece to the outside frame. So it won't be completely free until, com until it's completely done. And we'll go back and actually just trim those with a little tool nice. um, to release them. Kind of like a, like a sprue on a model kit. Exactly. So are you gonna do the whole thing with the same size bit? 
Pretty much, we're gonna do one pass with a drill. It's just gonna drill a bunch of holes, then we'll actually use those holes to hold everything down. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back with a quarter inch end mill and mill out all of the outlines. Okay, cool. So at first, this is just a very expensive drill press. It is a very expensive <laughs> drill press. <laughs> Guys, uh, so I was looking at the 3D print and the, the cup is at an angle. And I I don't know, is that gonna be a problem? Or is this just the yeah. 3D print? Yeah, it's partly the 3D print. That This actually brings up a very interesting conversation point. <laughs> uh, and, and, this, and it also illustrates the challenges of doing this table. Mm. What I didn't realize when we got into this is because of the hexagon and the angled panels, each one of these cuts is a compound angle, which explain, explain what that involves. So <laughs> the, the challenge is, you know, you have a big machine that can cut, you know, parts out. Well, much like a laser cutter, it cuts straight down. And only straight down. And only straight down. Like there's not a good way, you could, you could maybe tilt the head, but then every only one side of it would be at an right. angle. So it'd be kind of weird. So what we're doing is we're trying to come up with these compound angles with straight cuts. So we're doing a lot of things to kind of cheat that. So one of the things we talked about this morning, oh well, yeah, here's one of the ways that we're doing it. <laughs> we're actually gonna put a uh, compound angle with a second operation. Right. So we'll cut out the outline, and then we'll use that to come in and actually cut the angles on the pieces that have to be angled. As a second process? As a second process. Ah. So, but for the cup holder, <laughs> We talked about this and we actually decided on a different solution this morning. Yeah, because what, what I realized is if a straight up and down hole, if you have say like a pint glass and try to put it in here, it the walls aren't straight up and down, so therefore it makes the glass stick out like that. Right, and spill. Right, so uh, there's a few different ways we could have handled this. Mm -hmm. One way was we could have built an elaborate jig that is at the angle 15 degrees which the tabletop would be at clamp it to a drill press and then use a three inch hole saw to get the hole up and down <laughs> so that was one way that's one way uh zach came up with a much better idea i think which is to cut it straight oversized oh so this is bigger than it needs to be yeah and okay. then we'll do a 3d printed insert that has the proper angle Oh! So I have a nice trim ring that has the inside straight up and down huh. and underneath the, to protect everything from moisture yeah. and to keep things from moving around will be a piece of ABS pipe that is underneath here. At okay. the right angle. Yeah. And so you'll never see from the top that this is not the exact right exactly. up and down angle. Exactly, yeah. it'll all be covered. Cool. So I think that's an easier solution with, with the tools we have available such as the 3D printer. That I think that's the better I'm glad to see some 3D printing involved in this yeah, project. Yeah. yeah, like that's not enough? <laughs> yeah, <right>. yeah. <laughs> Zach, this router is amazing. I, I really only come from like laser cutting and 3D printing background, but uh, I mean, what is this machine and what, what can it do? So it's basically a milling machine or a, or a CNC router. 
Um, the head over there, the cylindrical piece, mm. is um, just like a big drill. So this happens to be a three kilowatt drill, which is a really powerful <laughs> drill. Um, it's actually water, it's a water-cooled spindle. And these are um, actual water lines coming in? They're actual water lines coming in. There's actually the temperature gauge up top that's uh, 29 degrees huh. uh, centigrade. So it's just a little bit warmer than room temperature. It's probably a little warm in here. But actually there's a water pump that's circulating cooling through there. Nice. Um, it can go up to 24,000 RPM which is really, really fast. 24, what have we been running at for uh, 12, about half that. <laughs> okay. Um, is, that, is that pretty typical for a router? Um, for routers, yeah. Routers usually are up in the, the you know, tens of thousands of RPM because that's just how the bits are made and the material that you're cutting really works well at those high speeds. If you're cutting um, harder materials, metals, um, you know, aluminum you'd slow it down some, steel you'd have to slow it down way more. Huh. That's why you typically don't see steel being cut on a router. You can do it, but it takes a lot of cooling, it takes a lot of other kind of tricks to make that work. But for plastics, for woods, for any kind of soft materials, high speed, well you can see how fast it cuts. I mean, we made tons of cuts in, yeah. you know, 20 minutes. So, um, yeah, it's really, really designed for that. And then, you know, because you're moving this kind of big heavy thing through big heavy material, you need a lot of mass. So if you look at sort of smaller machines, you know, like your X cars and your Carvies and sort of these things, you know, they're kind of limited on their speed because of their mass and rigidity. You know, you can only push something so quickly before things start bending and moving and you start losing precision. Right. So the heavier and the more massive it is, and, and the more, you know. So there. <laughs> the, this is a big steel column, yeah. you know, that, that is all welded up and it's, it's, it's very stout. And that lets you, you know, go at high speeds and not deflect. Um, hmm. You know, really the weakest thing that you want is the tool at the end. Everything else should be rock solid. So, um, you know, that's kind of why this thing weighs so much. And it can actually move as quickly as it can because it's so stout. Sean, I thought we'd take a break just so I could show you some of the stuff I've been working on the electronics side now that we got almost everything cut. I actually just got some parts in yesterday, the, the specifically the board, the circuit board that controls the LEDs. Nice. Uh, so we, we now have that ready to go as well as the circuit board for the controllers. So those are two entirely different systems. Are these custom boards that you design? Yeah, so the purple parts are the circuit boards They tie everything together. Now Mike Micah had the genius idea to make our controller board basically accept Atari 2600 I noticed, paddle I, as soon as I saw those jacks, I knew exactly what they were. <laughs> so this actually works perfectly with the 2600 paddle. Really? You plug it in and uh, this would be players one and two, and this would be players three and four. So it's just like a 2600, and to the computer, it looks like an Xbox joy, uh, gamepad. Because like that's, we talked about that's before. what, even though we're using the spinner and the button, they're mapped yeah. Inside to Xbox. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, so <clears throat> this is, I believe this is the first X input to a 2600 adapter. Cha-ching. In the world. <laughs> uh, so that's actually, that's actually fun. We're going to open source that and let other people make those for themselves. Jeremy, that's awesome. But the hard part is going to be like connecting a 2600 uh, paddle to that is pretty simple. But right. making our own controls look like paddles, it's just going to be a wiring pain in the ass. But it's worth it because we got this cool compatibility. There's only so, six of them. I know. So we're going <laughs> to wire four of our controllers into a couple of these and then the last two into a third. We'll use two of these mm -hmm. to run the whole thing. It'll look like two game pads to the computer. That's um, so yeah, really I'm super cool. psyched about that. Um, and that's done, it's tested and it, and it all works. We're gonna use the start <clears throat> and the back buttons for credits and, and menus to set the in-game stuff, like as far as like how long are the games and what right. the difficulty settings are. That Mike wanted those features. So they're all in there and that's cool. Uh, the other board that I just, that I mentioned that arrived yesterday is the LED board. Yeah, so I'm super excited for you to share this off. This is kind of neat because it, we're actually running two different kinds of LEDs. <clears throat> we're running, um, for all the panels that in, in front of the players. Yeah, these the, silver parts, those right. Those are going to be APA 102s, which is um, the kind of LED I prefer. But for the LEDs inside the buttons, which mm -hmm. Other Ocean requested, special request, yeah. let's have the buttons light up. Those are actually going to be NeoPixels, which is a totally different technology. But Ada Fruit again, right? Yeah, they're the ones that named them NeoPixels. Their yeah. their generic brand is the you know WS twenty eight twelve, and they will be both of them will run from this very powerful Teensy board. Okay, uh, so it can do both simultaneously, uh, thanks to some cool new libraries that 
don't block interrupts. Um, so this is great. So um, I'd love to plug <clears throat> these in and show you what those look like. Please, They're yes. running through a uh, track mode right now. Um, <laughs> and so if we were to attach them all daisy chain, they, they would turn on. But let's see if we can just get one working for now. Mm -hmm. There we are. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it can be any color. So, and this is, uh, this is, we haven't done, as we discussed, a ton of 3D printing on this, but we did uh, Adafruit release files for these little uh, frosted inserts yeah. that you can put in these guys. So we, we printed some of those on the form too. This is a generic arcade button, but inside uh, they come apart very easily. Yeah. And the insides- um, Which is nice. You can replace with, uh, you gave me this cool translucent yeah. print. Um, and it worked great. And the, the LEDs are on this tiny little circuit board which are a pain in the ass to solder to. Um, unfortunately, like this wire is, <clears throat> it's wider than the than the hole that it comes out of, mm -hmm. and it just it gives it a little too much resistance. I think I'm going to end up replacing this wire with oh, no. one of these on this side. It's just going to be a little more work, but it's going to be worth it because I want the buttons to, you don't want the buttons to stick in an arcade game. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I love yeah, it. Yeah, look Those at that. Cool. So the the the. Rainbow goes around and around and around, and that's the attract mode. And then when somebody enters the game, it can be their color, you know, because right. we have six colors for the different quadrants. Let's back up a minute. Attract <laughs> mode. That's that's you're, that's actually like arcade lingo, right? Yeah. Because it's like draw. It's look at me. It's it's put money in me. Look, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Look, I'm it. I'm cool. So it catches your eye, and so we want to make it look fun. So the, yeah. the the screen will be doing some cool animations that right. will make you want to play the game. Cool. Right. This one, this one is, is totally <clears throat> different. It, it runs off of this other panel, and if, uh, if this, can, this might be a little bright. So, avert your eyes. Let's see here. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's currently mapping the entire board right. <coughs> to a single strip. Um, okay. But this is one strip. This will be the length of one, one of these panels. Right. Uh, so, just for testing, um, this I, is my, I love this. I this threw this so one cool. away. This one did not work. This was the first test. We, yeah. we took a look at this in the shop a while ago. And the lights just bleed from one to the next. And while it does sort of catch the light, it doesn't... doesn't you, should, right. you should explain a little bit about what you're, what you're going for here. You wanted like these, the bar grass. Well, I wanted to make <coughs> the most of the LEDs, you know? So if you put it behind plastic, it, you know, you, it's one way to go, but you still get this pinpointing yeah. effect. Yeah. So I thought if we edge lit some acrylic, then it would pull it up and it would create a bigger volume of light, you yeah. know, based on one on the strip. <clears throat> but what I found worked well was to split up the cuts and to make each of the fingers uh, independent. So this oh really... Oh my god, that looks so good. Yeah, this really captures <laughs> the light. And it, you can this you can distinguish from one LED to the next. Yeah. So I imagine we'll put it, you know, put some black acrylic behind it. Yep. Uh, just so then it's looks not so good. Totally transparent. Jeremy, I'm I'm really impressed. So the key here uh, for for those out in the audience who want to do this, you made sure you cut away the material between each one, which isolated yeah. the light onto the separate bar. Because it turns out the light stops moving through the material if there's no material there. Good thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, Zach has talked to us about internal reflectance, and yeah. uh, so this is this is an, it was an interesting experiment. I can't believe how good that looks. That that. That's that's gonna make a good attract mode. Yeah, generally. yeah. So each so each player will have you know one of these in front of them, yeah. and right now every six LEDs is a player. So if you can imagine what that will look like, it's gonna be neat because when you start the game, it's all gonna be your color. And that's that's it. The uh, you asked for big long potentiometers yeah, because what I what we came to realize was um, we have three quarter inch MDF that we're we're using for the control panel, and most potentiometers are. Less yeah, they're like, you know, a little short guy. Yeah. Um, and the threads tend to be fairly short. So what I realized the problem was we could route out the back of the panel mm -hmm. and make thinner MDF to mount to, but I was a little concerned about like it wear and tear and holding up well. Sure. So my plan is uh, we found these nice long ones that we can trim to whatever length we need. But the idea is that we'll have a metal plate that this screws into. And then that plate will screw into the back of the MDF. This will just go the whole way through and the knob goes on top. And you can make that whatever, the, you can cut it down. <clears throat> yeah, um, so uh, I think that that will work well. It'll protect them better and it'll be a more secure mount. I agree. Um, and the, all that MDF will also be a nice support for this. And I think it'll yeah. work okay and, and we'll go from there. The nice thing is I was able to find 
uh, potentiometers that are the same resistance as the 2600 paddles. Oh, so it's like direct mapping. So it is direct mapping, yeah, which basically means the resistors I put on the board work with either one. That's fantastic. Um, and I was thinking, now we had talked about maybe putting a nice heavy paddle on there. Yeah. The problem is times six, that gets rather pricey. I'm thinking we can print 2600 paddle tops. Oh, that's nice. As a little homage to the original game and they might feel you know, just as well. <laughs> you know what's fantastic? Because you have that textured print bed on the Prusa, it, this is, this- It almost lo looks like a thing. It reads like that texture you get on the classics. Yeah. That's kind of great. Um, and we can print them in the colors of the players too, right? Like each of the six colors, I or, don't, or I not, don't, whatever, you know, yeah. the art team decides they'd like to do. Yeah, we haven't gone that far. <laughs> as, been, as, no, as hiring as an art been, team? It's no. been on my, it's been low on my list. <laughs> um, besides that, you asked for two inch speakers. I got six of them. We can see how they look. And yeah, they oh, those are, oh man, that's got some. Heavy, right? It's a full I range. I think these are gonna be, uh, yeah, we went from originally four inch down to two, two and a half or something like but that. But I love that each player gets um, their own speaker. Yeah, that's and gonna be I, cool. think, I, think, uh, I think these are still gonna put out plenty of sound and we found a under the seat car subwoofer that yeah. we're gonna try out putting it in the base. It's small, but it's, I think it'll be fine. And and it's kind of plug and play. It's got a little remote for the volume it's and a, stuff. It's and got its own amplifier. Yeah, so this will go like directly, they're gonna go in these holes here, directly yeah. in front, and then the, the subwoofer will be down here in the base. And we got three, three of these, right? Okay. So we have uh, each, every uh, two players gets one amp for those speakers. Yeah. Um, so what I'm That's thinking is with, so we, as we talked about, the, the top will come off for transport. Yeah. And then the hub comes off. And we, we have room to work in here, but like we may want to try to house most of the electronics in here. Mm -hmm. And then that's with, like with the, a big connector. That, yeah. Like a Molex. With. Yeah. And I think that might be. And then we'll have access from below here for the HDMI and the power for the TV that we'll have to plug right. in. But and obviously all the speaker wires will run through. Yeah. Some connector. Yeah. So okay. well, that's we're still figuring that out. But yeah, I'm not too worried about that. We can always cut wires and yeah. So what else do we have to do electronically? Ah, uh, uh, well, I have to finish these off. Like they're all cut, but I have to solder connectors because there's six of them. Okay. I have to solder them all together so that they daisy chain kind of like these. I talked about fixing this wire. I yeah. think I'm gonna have to do that. Um, and then there's a little bit of code left to let other ocean control the lights in these. I'd like them to be able to do what they want with the player buttons. Right. Um, but just that's just small tweaks. I think by the time we're ready to build. Uh, back and tested. Mm -hmm. I think we'll be ready to go. I think I'll be ready to have all the parts. Um, one thing I'd like to know from you is: Are is this the right size, or do you do you want this <clears throat> the backing panel to be larger? But we can cover that when whenever you're ready. Yeah, that's the. What, we have all the main stuff cut. Yeah. We still need to figure out this inner panel because they're going to be acrylic, right? Uh, outside and inset. So we, we, I haven't quite figured that out, but we'll, okay. we'll get it. It's laser cutting. Yeah, I see some 3D printing in there too. Maybe. Oh, let's do, yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right, cool. I think I hear the machine has stopped. Shall we go check out the parts? Let's check it out. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, so you were up bright and early before you even got here cutting sheep three. I was. Um, it out. Which, which are some key components that we were dying to have yesterday. Because <laughs> it's, right? it's these, uh, this is part of the hub. So the hub will have this top layer and a lower sheet that kind of sits down here and the panels will glue onto this so it'll all be one piece. So we'll slide this on and it holds the legs in place. Keeps them all lined up and gives it a little strength. Right, but, but the key piece that we were like, is this all gonna fit together? Is this gonna work? Right. Is this guy. Yeah, this oh, is man. the how do we get it home part, yeah. right? Woo. It's huge. Ah. It's, so, you know, we did. The, I did the phone core mock-up, which is just one station. But when you put six stations all together, oh. all right, is it, so, it going to go? Oh my God, did you see that this dropped right on the slots? That's so nice. The table is slotted here to take the fins just for kind of alignment and keep everything from moving around. And I think we nailed it. Guys, this is an arcade cabinet. <laughs> Look at this. We could we could sit right so, here. This is awesome. Or we could play poker. I mean, like we're yeah, all exactly. set up to do it's it. It's kind of like, like that. This, this, is about, that. this is about the size of a poker table. It's 48 inches flat to flat. and and. Part of that is the, our material is limited to like 49 inches. Yeah, that, that basically uh, tops it out. I mean, you can get extra special wide stuff, right. but that's super exotic. And the TV is gonna sit this way and there's, it, it just fits, it's just enough room. So, um, but this, and then going to point to point, it's more like 55 inches. So we do have like how we're gonna fit this in a vehicle. Yeah. So. Uh, we did the best we could on that. I think we're gonna have to have a, uh, 
you know, to transport it to the event, like we're gonna have to have some kind of ve bigger vehicle, but well, that's, we'll that's future us part. So um, we also did, da -da -da -da, fins, let's see if these slot in. So these are where the cleats will go that the panels will sit on top of. All right, Zach, um, we have CNC'd all the primary pieces, but exactly. there's still, there's a little cleanup. We have like these tie down tabs that Jeremy's been zipping off. Yep. Um, we need to bevel some pieces and we need to do this, the, the classic T-molding. Exactly, which you see on every arcade every, cabinet. Every arcade. It's held together with tape and spit. Pretty much. <laughs> Literally a little bit of tape, but also a lot of glue. You guys really showed how much you can do with just glue. Yeah, yeah. like all these cleats are all held on with glue and some staples while it dries, but the glue's, the glue's really gonna nice. do the work. It's gonna just have these cleats that all the panels rest on, and um, we have to do the same thing for the inner acrylic panels, which we'll do later, but I think we've taken a number of your valuable shop time, Zach. <laughs> So it's we got a good. little bit more to do, but the hub system totally worked. It slid on and off easier than we thought. Yeah. Um, everything seemed to line up pretty good. We it all fits. We killed your router. Well, <laughs> you know, it was on its last leg anyways. So uh, I'm really happy with it. Uh, the weight feels pretty good. And now we just gotta start installing electronics and stuff and see if the TV will like truly fit and, <laughs> and we're good exactly. to go. I can't wait. Yeah. Well, next time you see it, it'll be uh, in your shop in San Francisco. I hope so. Zach, thank you again so much for all of your My help. My pleasure. My thank pleasure. You, sir. Of course. Happy to help. All right. Uh, we'll we have officially built cool stuff, I would say. I would you say have. So. You are members of Built Cool Stuff <laughs> at this point. Awesome. <laughs>